Thank you very much, uh, Janos. I had the advantage, being a sociologist, to do my PhD within and in the School of Public Health in, in Boston. So in a way then I was kind of commandeered into population and international health. And since then I've been working on HIV, malaria, and TB, and, and looking at issues of uh, mature epidemics and also the challenges uh, of getting people on antiretroviral therapy for a longer time. Because we're asking 14-year-old to sign up on ARVs, and we sometimes don't think that they're going to be on ARVs for the next 50-something years. And what does that mean uh, in this particular respect? But for, uh, for this talk, um, I want to go through about four or five slides very quickly, and then I can go back to uh, what I was charged to, to do. As I've been introduced, I migrated to South Africa in January this year, so I'm part of the migration problem um, to take over as director of the institute, but formerly I was at Makerere University um, as principal of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. I start from um, a disclaimer that I can't talk for Africa, because Africa is such a big place that none can claim, and I think this is one of the problems I had with Cordesria, that was trying to invent Africanness, and 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 uh, and so you can see that you can fit U.S., you can fit China, you can fit India, uh, you can fit Germany, Spain, in Africa. And, and, and so that shows you that you can never talk about Africa uh, because it's so diverse, it's so extensive uh, that, that it becomes a very uh, a big thing. And also it's very difficult to talk about Africanness because if I use the example of my family, my sister is married in France, she lives in Normandy, so she's a French. My brother lives in uh, uh, Rocca di Papa in Italy, he's an Italian. My son, who is a telecom engineer, lives in Nairobi. And my eldest daughter, who is now doing her international law uh, master's degree, uh, does it in China, and she speaks Mandarin. So then my family, I don't know who we are. Um, so are we African? Are we, so I, I think, um, so that is the first thing that I wanted to uh, point out on the diversity and complexity of talking about African and, and, and even beginning to look at the partnerships that we're developing. The second one is to look at the refugee problem. And in the morning, uh, we were told that the, human refugee, the humans are not the problem, but probably the animals are the problem. And I think, again, the refugees may not necessarily be the problem. And when you look at the distribution, you actually find that most of the refugees are within Africa, and that very few refugees are so it's not refugees from Africa to Europe, it's actually refugees within Africa that is the main, the biggest problem. Um, the third uh, slide that again I want to look at is the top 10 refugee hosts. And you can see that in the top 10 refugee hosts, it's only Germany and Europe that features in the 10 top refugee hosts. So perhaps the refugee problem is actually much bigger African problem than it is a European uh, problem. And you can see Uganda is the third top refugee host country. We have 1.3, and that's the officially uh, registered refugees, but I'm sure that we go up to 1.7 uh, uh, million refugees that are given our position. I come from Uganda uh, originally. And so, um, whenever I can, I throw in Uganda in my conversation. The other one that I'll reflect on as one of the possibilities of looking at the perspectives that I'm going to address is the issue of migration and looking at the global compacts, uh, both in terms of global compact on migration, 
and the Global Compact on Refugees and seeing how this introduces diversity in the conversation that we have in partnerships um, that look at strengthening border control on the one side for migration and building self-reliance on the refugees and thinking that perhaps the conversation or the narrative should be cutting across rather than sort of being uh, distinctive um, in, that, in that respect. For example, you would expect that in terms of migration, you can actually have uh, structured or constructive migration, but you can see that the legal framework that works in that direction is more restrictive than actually it is with the, with, with the refugees where probably you don't have choice of who you get. The other last um, um, slide that I wanted to put there that we've actually been hosts, and again talking about Uganda, that we've been hosts to uh, Polish refugees in the 1940s. And, and so uh, if you find some Polish remnants in Uganda, then you can trace them. And, and this is a photo of young Polish women living in exile in Uganda in the 1940s as the Second World War was going on. And, and, and there are very many um, examples that we can give, uh, including the financing, unfortunately, the financing of the British soldiers in the uh, World War II. If you go in the archives, you, you will find that uh, more than 55% of the financing of the British war was coming uh, from uh, this direction. So that does for the uh, for the uh, for the um, slides. And going back now to what I wanted to uh, uh, discuss on re-reading, and, and and again the slides that I've shown demand that we should re-read. You know our perspectives, our understanding, our appreciation of the Africa's context. Um, uh, in building parity-based uh, long-term um, um, global partnerships. And, 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 and to start by saying that uh, um, if we look at the African context or the Africanness, one recognizes the fact that Africans or African citizens negotiate their social existence between various and myriad spaces. So I think that the aspect may actually be one of looking at spaces than perhaps nationalities. What kind of spaces are we negotiating on a, a daily basis, urban spaces, rural spaces, continental or transcontinental spaces, and, and all the market and political forces that influence the relationships. And sometimes citizenship and borderland conversation constrains us to see the dynamic uh, and the richness for that, for that matter with which we should come to the discussion of building parity best uh, long term because they develop a narrative that is descriptive rather than a narrative that is problematized and, 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 and active and, and increasing the place of agency in that particular uh, respect. So then, you know, we need to reread, for example, the dialogue or the conversation around citizenship, around borderlands, because um, um, as I said, from my family, I don't know whether we fit in Uganda. And now I've even left and I'm in, in, uh, in uh, South Africa, uh, but I passed through Uganda because my mother um, is, and, and so even the question of home becomes a challenge. What is your home? And, and I know that some of the scholars have said, uh, or, or even uh, um, one, of the, uh, one of the scholars said, you know, home is where you work. Um, and so then if we extend the conversation and say, so what is your nationality? Um, and the same thing in Uganda when people ask you, what is your home? Usually you tell them the barrier place, not actually where you work. Um, and so, uh, and it causes a lot of problems in, uh, in generating statistics and big data in, in that respect because uh, the meaning and in the morning, the meaning issue was, uh, was, was raised. So that's one thing that I wanted to point out 
the diversity, the complexity, and the, the, the movement of, of spaces within which uh, we operate. So even when we're talking about building parity-based long-term global partnerships, they have to be conscious of the fact that these are dynamic. And, uh, and so sometimes the bilateral relationships get into problems uh, because of that. And also in the same vein, two issues there, one of spaces, uh, the other issue of identity. And, and when we talk about this, so it has been argued that a racial, sexed, or gendered understanding of who we are and others are neither exclusive of the meanings we can be said to, to, to have, nor uniquely correct, and that all identities have a restricted uh, scope and can uh, lead to injusti injustices and contradictions when they are employed beyond that scope. So when we talk about identity, uh, again, it raises issue in terms of, uh, in terms of building uh, parity-based uh, long-term uh, global uh, partnership. So it's space or spaces and it's identity within which now we have to negotiate the conversation around the relationship uh, between uh, Europe on the one hand and Africa uh, or between the North and South and, and, and some of these uh, relationships. So I thought that I should do that preamble and if I can't say anything, uh, the takeaway the take home is, is that, uh, is that uh, conversation where uh, you find that um, it's, it's problematic um, in narrowing. The third element that I also want to uh, point out as, I, as I, I, I go into the conversation is the use of narratives, uh, which again we discussed with my colleague here, um, and, and sometimes the understanding again is that you know, you, you're developing what a, a perspective, a way of thinking, and that in itself can also be uh, problematic. And so my choice of the two narratives or perspectives that I want to just briefly talk about uh, should be seen in a way of providing a point of departure rather than providing a base for explaining and understanding the issues related uh, with building uh, a parity-based long-term uh, global partnerships. And I think that, uh, Janos, that's why probably the first aspect of, uh, of uh, unequal Siamese uh, twins uh, got into, into problems, which actually I kind of liked, but um, um, I, uh, I, um, I, I agreed that you know, we can sort of. So then <clears throat> I think the point there is that all identities have restricted scopes, so in a way they are not uh, permanent. There is no permanence to, to identity and, and, and therefore it's usually uh, very problematic to say Africans. And now living in South Africa, I'm actually seeing this in real life. You find the South African white that identifies himself or herself much more of an African than actually the Africans. Um, where you find the South African, black South Africans thinking that they're more superior than the rest of the black Africans and, and, and getting into issues of identity crisis almost. So as, in, in as far as you're building parity relationship or parity based long-term global partnerships, you actually have you know, um, dynamism, you have problems within the various identities uh, that you, uh, you, 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 you are coming up with. The other bit is, of course, again, to know that production and consumption of knowledge are socially and politically mediated. And unfortunately, we can't deal away with the politicians uh, because the social political nexus in defining production and consumption of knowledge, and also by, by in, in relation in building parity-based long-term global partnerships uh, becomes, becomes an issue. And unfortunately, the world seems to be churning out a certain type of politicians. 
Um, and, and, and the issue then is that how do we deal with that certain type of politicians? And uh, as our, last night we were talking and saying, you know, that Europe is beginning to give good examples to our bad African leaders uh, because then they keep pointing up north. Um, so uh, I think again in building uh, parity uh, based long term uh, global relationships, I think there's an opportunity here of reflection and perhaps challenging uh, some of these uh, aspects. So given that, then I propose two perspectives uh, in my presentation. The first one, the way we can look at building parity uh, based long term relationships is to look at probably what has been the dominant paradigm and the dominant uh, paradigm has been one that tends to historicize the interconnectedness and tensions thereof uh, between Europe and Africa, and where you're talking about slave, slave trade, colonialism, all those kinds of things, and, and using that narrative to address um, or to uh, address the imbalances. And sometimes the problem with that kind of narrative is that it makes people apologetic. People feel like they owe either the African or the African feels like it must get what didn't get. And I have problems with that. And I have problems with that, especially now living in South Africa where after apartheid, you find that the black South African think that what was theirs now is ours and we don't have to work for it. And so using history or historicizing parity uh, parity-based long-term relationship within a context from, uh, from a historical uh, perspective and gets you into all sorts of things. And, and I tell my government back home and say, it's been 60 years plus after colonialism. So you can't, you can't say it's history that is making us what we are. And so that, but that unfortunately becomes or has been the main um, <clears throat> narrative that, uh, that, that uh, and it creates situations of dependence and creates situations of expectations and creates situations of demand um, and doesn't in a way bring um, element of responsibility that comes with it. And unfortunately that kind of narrative now is working into the refugee conversation. Um, to the extent that now, you know, like for example, Uganda has an open door policy, but in a way is using refugees as, as, a, um, as a pawn in the game and, and, and using it to demand that, okay, you don't want the refugees in Europe, pay us to have them. Um, and, and it gets you into a lot of uh, problems. So we start cooking up figures and we do all sorts of things. We use that for HIV, we've run out of excuses with HIV, we've used it with security because now we say we can pacify uh, Somalia and, and therefore, you know, it's a historical problem and you, every, the whole world has to pay for it. Um, unfortunately, now we have Kenya coming in and Rwanda, so we're losing out on the security problem. Now it's refugees. Again, you find that we're using a historicized narrative uh, to build uh, parity-based uh, relationships and we're not really uh, making uh, that much um, headway. The second perspective is the one that I think is probably much more, um, <clears throat> a much more way of looking at, of looking at developing um, uh, partnerships where there is a recognition of conviviality and incompleteness um, of humanity. In a way that, and, and the point I mentioned in the morning in our group, that one of the group members said, I don't know your place. So there is an issue of incompleteness on all of us that allows, therefore, to build parity-based long-term partnerships because then there is an assumption, an assumption of learning and equal learning uh, on, on, on both on both. Uh, sites. So those are the kind of two bases that I think that we can use. Um, <clears throat> and I think the conversation in the morning about diseases, 
uh, does provide us um, a way of looking at that incompleteness and conviviality. In other words, that we begin to challenge um, the, um, you know, the dominant narratives and, 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 and paradigms in a way that you find that you know, if HIV um, um, infection happens in Kampala, right there it's already affecting the entire world because in Kampala where it is happening, it's a cosmopolitan space. And again, I talked about space. And within that space, there is actually the whole world. There, uh, there are uh, tourists that have come in. There are um, 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 business people that are there. You have, uh, uh, you have the, the uh, you have everybody there. And, and therefore, it becomes not an issue for Uganda. It actually becomes an issue for all of us. And therefore, there is, it becomes an issue uh, for, for, uh, for the... So, so in a way, it calls for a shift in paradigm from knowledge creation, for example, that is fraught with competition and power, uh, to knowledge sharing. Um, that proposes a partnership and therefore one of the issues that we're looking at in creating uh, uh, building towards parity based long-term global partnerships i think maybe we need to shift from the aspect of knowledge creation which introduces competition and sometimes introduces um, in, 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 in knowledge production spaces, uh, in a way, sometimes introduces the element of, of holding information to one of, uh, of knowledge uh, sharing as, as a way. And, and so that's the kind of um, perspective that I wanted to put on the desk to challenge us to go beyond simply seeking partnership creation from the position of history that was convoluted or history that had its challenges so that we learn from history rather than history shaping why we should go into uh, partnerships but also to know that you know we 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 are all incomplete in in a way and and so we need to be working towards sharing uh, rather than producing. Uh, because if we do start from the point of producing, then, then you have to compete. And one example I have, I have been uh, chairing the Global Fund uh, for the Eastern African region by the time I left. So I was in charge of about four uh, billion US dollars grant. And that's one thing that I'm very happy that I left. Uh, because uh, it brings all kinds of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of problems. But the example I wanted to give there is that one time we did a, one time uh, a group of scholars did a surveillance a survey um, and they held on to information for three years because they wanted to publish first before they could share that information. And that's what knowledge production narrative does. Because you, once you share it, then you can't publish it, you know? And secondly, you want to publish in Lancet. So you will hold on for 10 years to get into Lancet when you could have actually shared that knowledge um, right there. So if we're into the business of building parity best a long-term part partnership, then it's going to be more about knowledge sharing um, risk sharing and all these different kinds of things rather than necessarily saying we colonized Africa therefore we must help them or we did this uh, or Africa saying you colonized, you colonized us so the problems we have are because you did and I don't think that that, that conversation no longer holds. Um, if my presidency has been around for 33 years he can't blame anybody. Thank you very much.